paid by Zahn's. The time has come. On the air since 2009, the independently produced, non-FCC compliant champ of video game talk podcasting. Here comes Tiger Claw Radio. Here's your host, Critical Failure. Yes, friend, it's that time again. You're listening to Tiger Claw Radio. I'm your host, Critical Failure. This week, we got some games, we got some chip tunes, good times. And I gotta say, it feels really good to be back to the top 40 for um, the 8 Bit Collective archive. Also, our good buddy Hemrock checks in with uh, the first entry on his top 8 of the first 8 of the Final Fantasy franchise. Let's start things off uh, with a track. From the the next track from the top forty, okay. So the next one is number twenty. That's Nobuyuki. Never see again. Okay. So this being t- uh, number twenty, we are halfway through the list. Remember, you can check out the entire list from um, on YouTube from our good buddy Hemrock, who posted it uh, as as a giant ship tune special before we even got started. So again, big thanks to Hemrock for putting this together. More on TCR in just a minute. Stick around.
That's a heck of a track, man. It really is. And I gotta say, that is a track that captures the attitude of the late 2000s, you know, mid to late 2000s when 8-Bit Collective was, uh, you know, the cultural hub for chiptunes. Great track. Great track. Um, okay, so heading into TCR this week, wasn't sure uh, what I could bring to the table to make it interesting. And then it occurred to me, I know what I'm going to do. I've got a little a pre-recorded bit uh, um, about the RG505, the Amberdeck handheld. That finally showed up, uh, um, you know, undamaged, ready to go. So I've been working with that for a little while. I got some reactions uh, to the first couple weeks of being able to use that. But that said, after that, I'm going to pause the recording and watch an entire Steven Seagal movie. And then we're just going to do the rest of the show just with Steven Seagal brain. And just see what happens. Uh, but first things first, uh, let's go back to the RG505 reactions. So the RG505, just a quick recap. I uh, ordered the 503, and it broke inside of two weeks. So I ordered the 505, and it showed up with, uh, um, with a damaged screen. Well, I finally got a working one. Ambernick replaced it. Uh, screen works great, and I've been able to play it somewhat so um, I just wanted to get some rough thoughts down um, I'm gonna put this into a video in a, in a bit more of an organized format but just some rough thoughts having played with the Ambernick RG 505 the 505 feels a lot more like a phone and I know it's Android but this is an Android device that is has a touch screen and is a little bit larger than a smartphone these days feels a lot like a smartphone uh it has its integrated um like rom front end uh piece that you can scroll through and pick out games and stuff like you know like you would with any of the open dingux machines but it's got google play you know and uh, that's another thing some of the reviews online said that it did not have google play well now it does so um i've it, it's kind of cool to go from uh, you know, playing Super Nintendo, and then switching gears, and then playing the the my, uh, the um, Android version of Minecraft uh, with my son, which was great because it has it has built-in Wi-Fi, which is what I wanted out of the last thing I bought. Um, built-in Wi-Fi uh, was able to do some local uh, some uh, LAN party Minecraft with. My son on my phone and then me on this thing, and it was a great time. Um, there's weird compatibility issues when it comes to uh, Android apps. Um, like I think I mentioned before, the uh, Pizza Boy app, the Pizza Boy Game Boy Color um, app doesn't seem to work, but the Pizza Boy Game Boy Advance app does, which is very weird. Um, the Peacock app does not work, so I won't be able to watch WWE stuff. Um, the Impact Wrestling app does not work, so I won't be able to watch Impact Wrestling stuff. Um, most of like the streaming sites apps don't work. YouTube, however, does work, so I can still sit and watch some YouTube and whatnot. Um, I could take a page out of old Sendu's book and pop open a YouTube window and then shrink it down and then play something, um, you know, do a little multitasking, which is cool. It's been a cool device. Um, it runs really well. Uh, one thing I'll say is that the left joystick, uh, you know, the left analog stick has a bit of a drift issue. I can see it when I'm playing Among Us with my daughter. The little man will slowly walk to the left. Um, it, I, I haven't had it crop up in any other game. Um, my son pointed it out when he was uh, using when he was playing Minecraft um, that there that there was a drift issue, um, but that's the only time I've encountered it. My wife actually played with this machine, and she played Tetris Attack, which my wife barely ever touches uh, these machines. The only other time I can think of that she's done it is we were standing in a line one time uh, at Sam's Club. It was a long line. Uh, and I, I had, I happened to have the, the, uh, the, one of the smaller model Ambernex, the 280V. And I was like, here, play some Tetris. And I, and I was able to hook her up with, uh, the NES version of Tetris. 
and she dealt with the line a little better. Um, well, hang on. Speak of the devil. There she is. All right. I think we're good now. I think we're good. Right. So last night she was playing, uh, um, she played Tetris Attack. And she played it um, long enough that uh, she played until that she until she lost, which took like I don't know half an hour, forty five minutes, long enough that I dug out one of my other machines, started playing my wizardry save on the on the uh, on the V ninety. So that was exciting because uh, um, everybody in my house seems to be giving this device the seal of approval. So. So far, my thoughts are this. It's a great device. Um, it definitely has problems. I hope they make the same device, but but better functioning in the future. I want to see more uh, application compatibility, and I want to see the, um, the analog sticks not drift. But apart from that, man, it's been a good time. Uh, and my... Uh, just researching the device, what people say is that the PSP is where it really shines. It's supposed to play PSP games spot on and have a, you know, the, the screen ratio is, is perfect. Um, and I have not tried that yet. So we'll see how it goes. I haven't really had this thing flex its muscle, you know? Um, like it's supposed to play some selections from PS2 as well and Dreamcast and whatnot. I haven't done any of that. I haven't done any of that. Um, as it relates to ROMs, um, I've played Blast Chamber on it, and uh, I think that might even be about it. Blast Chamber, and then just like a few assorted um, Super Nintendo games to test. Uh, yeah, but I'm digging it so far. So uh, once I know more, I will check back in with you. That is the RG505, which I think is like $150 or $160. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look it up again. Okay, back again in the studio. Um, let's take a look. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. We're going to watch Above the Law, which is marked as uh, 1988. And I, as far as I know, it's the earliest Steven Seagal movie I can find. Uh, he was still pretty trim, um, and we're going to see what this does to my brain, because I've watched a couple of the late uh, career Seagal movies, but I haven't watched any of the ones that people regard as actually entertaining. Okay, let's see how it goes. There's going to be a lot less conversation and a lot more killing. <laughs> I'm out of breath. I almost made it through the whole movie. I really did. I got to the last five minutes, and I realized that <laughs> because of this little bit, podcast almost didn't come out today. This Friday is the last day to do it. I <laughs> is the last time I do this little gimmick, man. I thought it might be a fun little way to go through uh, Seagal's career, and as the movies got worse, <laughs> then it just got more and more difficult. But this is movie one, man. This is the very first one, so... The concept that I'm having so much trouble now uh, and ain't going to work. Um, <laughs> gosh. All right. We got to do. We got to do. I can't even remember what's up. What, what, what are the next few things are. We got a thing from Hemrock. We got to do the sponsors. And then I think. Uh, I don't know. Let's start with the sponsors. Patreon sponsored program. Thank you guys so much for uh, helping keep us coming back every week. <clears throat> so, in some respect, I like to read their names off in a hollow, distinguished gentleman. EmeraldRangers.com. That's the group that made the deal to put us back on the air. We got Hemrock, we've got Tecmo Balls, and we've got Dorobka. Thank you guys so much. I can't uh, say enough how much I appreciate it. And I hope you're enjoying the party. <clears throat> um, so with that, let's shift gears. <laughs> Jeez, it's so hard to talk. This movie's so dumb. And it's the it's like his his prime era, Steven Seagal. He was young and yeah, uh, it was cool to see Pam Greer though. Pam Greer is a national treasure. But anyway, let's shift gears. This is Hemrock coming up. He's going to talk to you about Final Fantasy. You're listening to Tiger Claw Radio. All right, let's start this list off. This Final Fantasy top eight list of the first eight games. The bottom of the list, number eight, 
is Final Fantasy 2. Ah, the black sheep of the Final Fantasy series. Nevertheless, a foundational installment. The reasons for which I will get to momentarily. Now, the version I beat was the PS1 rendition, which I have to say, the Final Fantasy Origins release for the PSX, uh, which includes the first and second Final Fantasy game, is a love letter to uh, those original games. It upreses the graphics while still preserving the pixel aesthetics and adds a more modern yet still captivating musical score. I highly recommend these versions for those interested in playing the original two games. Now, Final Fantasy II was a change of pace from the prior game. It removed the choose-your-own-class approach from the first game and replaced it with a narrative-driven experience. From the very beginning, you were given three characters with their own backstories, as well as one spot for an ever-rotating menagerie of guest characters. It's like the Final Fantasy version of an on-rails shooter. You're stuck with the party members you are given, and gone are the days of grinding for levels, because they also changed the battle mechanics. Battle system moved away from XP, and instead, specific attributes are increased or decreased based on how the character acts in battle. In addition to your attributes, you also level up different types of weapons or spells based on their use, requiring 100 uses per level. Now, on the surface, this seems intuitive, but it leads the player to perform unintuitive actions such as attacking his or her own party members. Want to increase your strength stat? Well, just keep spamming physical attacks. Many times it's easier just to attack your own party than the enemy. Better yet, don't even have to actually perform the attack. Just select the spell or physical attack, then immediately cancel it. The game will still count this as a completed physical attack or spell cast. Of course, you could just dismiss these actions as game exploits to be ignored. And while, yes, they certainly are exploits, the game does not have a natural level progression. You can't just play the game by going from point A to point B in a casual fashion and expect to survive. This type of funny grinding is near essential, or some type of grinding is essential, at least on the more difficult Famicom version. You might as well save yourself some time and just use the exploit. It boils down to a cumbersome battle system that you're fighting the entire game just to progress a story by today's standards is at best mediocre. As you can see, the game has not ironed out all its bugs, and this is probably due to it only being in development for a year. Now, some examples of these bugs outside of just the battle system is, say, for instance, the Ultima spell. Theoretically, the most powerful spell in the game, but it's bugged in the original Famicom release. Also, some of the bosses are not immune to spells such as Mini and Toad. And thus, a boss may be beaten with a single anticlimactic spell cast. Another issue I have with this game is that the guest characters start under-leveled. This adds more pain to an already clunky battle system, not to mention that you don't know when your guest characters will leave, which encourages the player not even to waste the effort on leveling up those particular guests. The guests can also take equipment away from your party. If you played the game before or you're using a guide, another exploit is to know when that character is leaving and take out all their equipment and give it back to your party before they take it with them and disappear into the ether. Outside the easily exploitable but somewhat annoying battle system and spell glitches, there's also limited inventory space. So 32 slots for the Famicom version and 64 for the PS1 version, both of which are less than ideal. For these reasons, the game lands at the bottom of the list. However, the game should not be ignored, and it did not totally misstep. It took some steps in the right direction. It introduced the unique password system. Learn a word and use it in conversations with NPCs to progress the story or gain an item. This was an interesting game mechanic, and it forced the player to pay more attention to the narrative, and that is what I believe the developers wanted, as this was very much a story-driven game. Now, spoiler alert, multiple characters in your party die. So believe it or not, Final Fantasy VII was not the first Final Fantasy to introduce a main character uh, passing away. This happens from some of the very early Final Fantasy series, including Final Fantasy II. Outside the story, one thing I like 
is the soundtrack. Especially the town music and the rebel theme. The PS1 version added some classical guitar-like tunage that suits the game quite well. Speaking of the music, the game introduces not only the adorable chocobos, but even the iconic chocobo theme, which is used in subsequent Final Fantasies. Other foundational introductions include persistent main characters, Iron Giants, Leviathan, Dragoons, and even the recurring character Sid. You gotta give Square some credit for taking chances on the sequel to their biggest game at that time. It probably would have been safer and easier to put a new coat of paint on Final Fantasy 1 with a larger world and some new enemies and call it a day. And you know that's exactly what would happen in today's world of repetitive sequels and live action retellings of previous material. But instead, Square took risks and they innovated. Despite the game being at the bottom of my list, I think it's one of the most underappreciated Final Fantasy. It's a great but flawed game and it's hard to stand out when you are on the dream team of RPGs known as Final Fantasy. I'd like to leave you guys with a pro tip. Because of how the leveling system works, there are only three viable builds in the game, and straying from any of these three is counterproductive since some skills will decrease when others are increased. Anyways, the three builds are Warrior, White Mage, and Black Mage. Concentrate on building these characters and do not try to make a character that is the jack of all trades, or a red mage, or a paladin, or some other creative build. It will not go well. I tried. In any case, I wish I had known this when I was first playing Final Fantasy 2. And now you guys know, and knowing is half the battle. Back in the studio. Okay, let's talk about Final Fantasy 2 a little bit. Big thanks to Hemrock for putting that together. There's not much I can say about that one, because I never played it. But I do want to um, comment on a couple things. I remember in the 90s, the late 90s, when I first in encountered um, uh, the you know emulation ROM scene, whatever, Final Fantasy 2 and 3 were the magic charms of the scene at the time, at least for me. I remember seeing... Cause, you know, in America, how we got one on the Nintendo, but then two and three we didn't get. Um, they showed up in the ROM scene fully translated very, very early on in the lifespan of, you know, the emulation scene. So I remember encountering those games and thinking that was magic, but I never actually sat down and played them. Um, three I played later in life uh, um, on the Ouya, but... It, I'm, I hear you talk about like the attributes versus character levels, and it sounds an awful lot like the transition from Dungeons & Dragons to GURPS, right? In Dungeons & Dragons, you have a party, and everybody's gauged by their levels. Uh, and in GURPS, nobody has a level at all. It's just skills, and the skills have levels. Um, so in that sense, uh, that I mean, some people prefer that, at least in the tabletop scene. So I could actually see giving that a try, uh, given that that's the big, you know, one of the big uh, changes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I thought that was a great, uh, a great piece. So big thanks to Hemrock. Uh, definitely a guy who spent a lot more time with the Final, franchise, Final Fantasy franchise than me. So I always love to hear what he has to say about it. Okay. So uh, that said, let's shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about... Um, the game from the box. That's right, the big box of games that I got at uh, Tiger Fest. Um, and and uh, this past week, we picked Romance of the Three Kingdoms 7. And I got a little confused about the number because it's Roman numerals and I'm dumb. Um, but I played Romance of the Three Kingdoms 7 uh, a little bit on the PS2. And let's be fair, these Koei games... Uh, I sat down with this game twice, and it's not fair to gauge a Koei game on two, two sittings. The learning curve is pretty steep, but once you get over it, you always find a, a great game. Um, I think most Koei games are that way, with the exception of the Uncharted Waters games. Um, I can tell... I play the Nobunaga's Ambition games a lot, and uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms is very, very similar when you boot it up and start kicking around a little bit, but it's way more political than Nobunaga's Ambition. Um, and for that, I honestly really like it. Um, especially playing it on the PS2 where the, uh, uh, where they're able to flex a little bit more, uh, um, with the portraits and stuff, but it still maintains its kind of simple map structure. Um, and the complexity then becomes, you know, 
which of these 11 or 15 different choices are you going to do each month for your for your uh, country um, I chose my playthrough as a commoner because uh, um, I, I believe that's what they called it the low hold on a second let me get, go to the static so the lowest level on the uh, political spectrum is basically designed for you to learn the game. And the idea is that you have a lord that you serve, and that lord will tell you what exactly they want you to do uh, with your time. And the idea is you follow what the lord says uh, in terms of what the, what's going to happen with the people. And then you can see how that affects the game. And thus you can learn, uh, you know... You, you can learn the ins and outs of, of running a territory, but then you can also you also have free control over relationships between um, between other other characters, other people. Because in your territory, you've got this whole host of different people you can talk to and have relationships with to hold position in, in you know in court. And and then also there's territories all around you uh, that you have relationships as well. So it it was nice to play the game and just have the local, uh, the the local um, economic choices be made for me, and then I could just work on on forming relationships. So I really enjoyed my time spent with it. Um, I ripped a copy of the of the CD because it's an it's as it turns out it's one of the smaller games in the um, on the PS2 library and I put it on my RG505 and uh, I got it running and it does run and I think it's going to be way better for the RG505 because one of the one of the things Koei does really well is it's comfy Koei does comfy very very well um, super comfy game um, so I'm looking forward to um, running my territory uh, while I'm supposed to be sleeping. <laughs> so that's the game in the box. One thing I haven't done is pick the game for next week. Hang on a second. Let me go dig in the box. Okay. So for next week, I'm going to play Dynasty Warriors 2, which I got disc only for two, uh, two ninety five, dollars uh, And I got this from Gamers Oasis in Harrisonburg, Virginia, um, which... I know there's a ton of these Dynasty Warrior games, but I never played any of them. And to be honest, until I started encountering them in the wild, I didn't even realize this was Koei. Pre-Koei Tecmo, Ko Tecmo Koei. So uh, I'm interested to find out what, uh, what you know the series holds. Got a couple of them in the box. Uh, I think I got Dynasty Warriors 5 also. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start early on in the franchise. We'll do them both, see how, see how it changes over time. Another thing is that only a small portion of these games are PS2 games, and most of the other ones are original Xbox games. So um, I'm going to see if I can uh, exhaust all my PS2 stuff so that I can um, get the original Xbox hooked up um, and then save a little counter space. So that's the, the, the logic behind the choices. I'm going for excuse me PS2 stuff so that I can maintain my hardware setup without making too many changes so those are my thoughts my my brief you know uh once over of the first couple hours uh of romance of the three kingdoms seven um hemrock you wanted my opinion on the game i like it it is good <laughs> that's not super informative in and of itself but i think you would like it it's good enough that i should put it in my cd drive and then kick around with a little bit on a let's play so you can see it but uh it's perfect perfect i think you, you you're a handheld guy all right you have an upper and uh, an upper echelon handheld if your handheld runs ps2 then uh especially especially for your setup i would recommend it um, although what I can't say is how it stacks up against the other Romance of the Three Kingdoms games for the PS2, because as it turns out, there's like four or five entries to that series just on the PS2. So, uh, uh, um, don't know if Seven is particularly the one to go for, but I've been enjoying it. <laughs> All right, shifting gears and doing the fail bag, because I am running out of time to get this episode complete. Today has been pretty crazy. Pretty crazy indeed. So uh, we're going to do a couple things. When I do the fail bag, uh, there's many places you can reach out to get in touch with me. Okay, I love to hear uh, stuff on Discord. I have my own Discord. Um, 
If you know me personally, feel free to shoot me an email. Just be clear about you know what I can and can't say on the air. Um, and YouTube is a good place to leave comments. But bear in mind the YouTube one that you're seeing is a week behind. Uh, and then we have EmeraldRangers.com, who actually uh, got us back on the air. So I like to read the Emerald Rangers stuff first, and then I. I also do a little once over of the headlines of the stuff that's come out in the past week so that you, uh, you know, have a little uh, insight as to what's going on in that website. So the first thing that, w that they have is Green Phoenix with a Super Mario Brothers movie review. And I should read this because I am interested to hear how the movie went, but I'm not interested enough to actually go out and see it. So uh, that's a, a write-up they have. We have Cheap Chivo's 11, Finger Gun, and Big Button. Um which is from Kaiser. And then we have Tiger Claw Radio, episode 447 uh, last week, which was about Retro Arc. Uh, and there, I didn't get any comments there, but that's what's going on over at Emerald Rangers. Okay, so I know I got something from, from Hemrock, and we just heard the, uh, the uh, um, uh, piece he wrote, or he, he recorded. But let's see what he actually wrote, because I know he put some stuff in the Discord. Um... Uh, Hang on a second here. Ba 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 ba. Tiger Claw Radio. Let's click on the fail bag. Yeah, here we go. We're gonna start with Kaiser. He says, "Excellent episode of TCR." Yeah, man. Retro Arc is the super system that. Oh, hang on one second. Yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Retro Arc is the super system that we all wished that we had as kids. There's a newer front end uh, out now called BizHawk. Uh, I was one of the bug testers for that software. While it doesn't have any fancy menus like RetroArch, it runs games very well. It has some support that RetroArch doesn't have. Yet, uh, it can run DSi games and Jaguar CD titles. Uh, it has potentially a good alternative if you want some extra systems to play. It's great hearing him rock again. I love it when he podcasts. Yeah, me too, man. He's such a great person to listen to. He has a great passion for games and his shows. Heck yeah. Speaking of emu machines, I've got an Ambernick RG35XX coming in the mail. One of the machines that you recommended. I'm looking forward to it big time. I love the screen and the game, a classic Game Boy setup. I was going with the uh, model with the joysticks. I was going to get the model with the joysticks, but I couldn't find a trusty seller for that. The RG35XX plays up to PS1 games, which is more than enough gaming for to last a lifetime. Yeah, I agree. I was dreading buying a micro SD card for setting up the custom firmware, but the storage has gotten so cheap that I managed to score the machine 1x64 uh, gigabyte card for the OS. Couldn't find a smaller card on sale. And one uh, 128 gigabyte card for games. That's all for around $120 Australian. That's cheap. Oh, uh, some other things I'm curious to hear your thoughts on. On April 1st, Bitmap Bureau announced uh, a port of Xeno Crisis that sounded faked, but it's 100% real. A GameCube port of a game uh, got announced. This is huge. Hopefully it means the GameCube will see a surge of new indie titles. Games uh, like... The Dreamcast gets. That'd be cool. Another April 1st thing that got announced was a new GBA video title. Yep, the best part is it's of the old Sega game Night Trap. Ah! That's all. Great episode, CF. Uh, that's cool, man. Thanks so much for writing in. He says, uh, you were also talking about some YouTubers you watch for uh, Emu Machine content. One channel I... Uh, one channel. Woo! We're going to go with it. One channel I recommend is Retro Game Core, a title that also uh, gives in-depth reviews on these machines, but it also has good tutorial videos on setting them up, too. It's a very no BS, all information channel that's far from boring. It's actually quite interesting. Tech Dweeb is another good one for you if you want some good uh, info on something that's a bit on the theatrical side. Hemro, Hemrock follows up. Jeez, oh, I can't say. Hemro. <laughs> Hemro follows up with a second Retro Game Core. Uh, it's great to hear from the Kaiser. I hope you keep writing into the show. Totally agree on both counts. Um, awesome to hear from you, Kaiser. Hope that RG um, 35, uh, 35XX treats you well, and let us know what you're playing on it. He left uh, one final comment saying that he'll try, and that it finally showed up. He shows a picture of uh, two pictures of, of the unit, one of uh, the... Uh, Machine is running Bubsy, and in the other, it's running what appears to be Street Fighter 3 Third Strike. 
and he says got garlic running on it. I really want one of those things because man, they look good. Man, oh man. Um, yeah, man, that's awesome. <clears throat> um, let's see how we're doing here. Let's see. I think there was something. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. This is uh, what Hemrock wrote along with his um, with his segment that he sent in. He said, hey, hey, Paizan, thanks for another episode. Please see my attached audio clip of number eight of the top eight of the, fir- of the first eight Final Fantasies. It's a lot of eights. In any case, I'm starting from the bottom and I'll work it up to number one. I recorded this about three months ago in the parking lot uh, outside of a convention center while waiting for the ATG Expo to start. Unfortunately, a van of esports fans pulled up next to me and started making a racket while I was recording. <laughs> Dirty esports fans. <laughs> if you listen very closely towards the end of the MP3, you might be able to hear them uh, honk on, on their van. Besides that, the audio has improved much uh, from the intro. Not sure uh, when I'll get to number seven, but I'll keep you posted. In other news, I've begun the process of building a new PC. Woo! Perhaps you partially inspired me, but I've been using the initial uh, NUC, which is a mini PC, for somewhere around four to five years. It works fine for the most part. However, it's not a gaming PC. Oh, yeah, we're good. Uh, I went to check out XCOM 2 on Steam about a month ago, and I realized I couldn't actually play it because my computer wasn't up to snuff. Additionally, when I was playing Stacklands, a game I recently picked up on sale from Steam, my mini PC was getting crazy hot. I also started having problems running Alpha Centauri. Oh, man, that's that's a bad sign. I felt that it was time to bite the bullet and build something that should last me five-plus years. I use hard drives that I'm already uh, kicking around, so hopefully I can sell my Intel and UC and help me cover the costs. I uh, chose the HP Z440 workstation as my base. I purchased more RAM. I even splurged on a rather nice GPU. Uh, I can tell you more if you're interested. Uh, Anyways, here's some other uh, smaller games on Steam. A few games to consider. Magic Scroll Tactics, Iron Cast, and Humankind. Keep rolling retro. I pop those three games open so we can take a look, but first let's address this computer. HP Z440 uh, workstation. Now, I wouldn't be familiar with that computer except because of that guy that you posted in the discord uh and where did you post that was it in the youtube um channel yeah yeah low tech uh low castle tech apparently buys a bunch of those computers for like 40 to 50 dollars on on ebay and then you know works them up because they're apparently garbage computers except that they use ddr4 ram they have a, a um they have a, a a socket slot that can fit several different types of uh, of of uh, like a pretty wide variety of, of CPUs, and and it has a PCIe slot for for um, for a graphics card. So you get this cheapo computer, and you got to update the uh, the the PSU, otherwise it'll explode. But then apart from that, it's more or less you know the, your your uh, your motherboard and your case are covered, which is nice. So, yeah, I've seen this guy do some really cool things with these. So, uh, yeah, good luck on your computer. Uh, props on recommending Low Castle Tech because that guy's pretty funny. Chair desk. And uh, let me know how it turns out. So let's check out Magic Scroll Tactics, Iron Cast, and Humankind. These are three Steam links that he sent. Magic Scroll Tactics. Uh, we got a side-scrolling game. Uh, looks... Uh, uh, We'll say anime-inspired. Side-scrolling tactical RPG by Oritendeshi. Now switchable between Japanese and English. All right. I like side-scrolling RPGs. Haven't played a good one of those in a long time. Uh, then we have Ironcast uh, for two ninety nine. And what do we have here? This looks like a match three game. All right. Like some match three. Especially nice to see one that doesn't have any waifus in it so I can play it around the family. Uh, and then finally, we've got Humankind. Humankind is a $50 game currently on sale for $10. Uh, turn-based strategy, 4X. That's I'm in. Those are the words. You say those words, I'm in. Um, there is a group on Steam that tracks 4X games particularly, and they say a historical 4X made by some of our favorite 4X developers uh, of all time. Thankfully, most they mostly pulled it off, too. 9 out of 10, or click the link to read the full review. Uh, and that's their that's their take on it. Good-looking game. Very modern 3D. I, when I think of 4X games, I usually like the ones that look and feel old. But this is uh, this looks very modern. So, yeah, I don't know. 10 bucks. 
10 bucks. Looks like it's going to keep this price until the 5th of May uh, if you're interested in checking it out. So big thanks to Hemrock for letting us know and for writing in, man. Good to hear from you. I hope you're, I hope you're doing well. And that said, let's do the final phase of Project Fail Bag, and we are going to jump over to YouTube. Now, if you're listening to this on YouTube, I post the episode from the previous week uh, on YouTube. So all the comments there, uh, they're great comments. I love to hear from you. Just know that you're going to be a week behind. All right, so I'm going to do this while I'm on the air because this is the one thing that happens every week is I open up YouTube um, to get to the um, studio and read the comments. And while I'm off the air, I get distracted and it ends up taking hours, and I don't have hours now. So, all right. (laughs) Last week's on YouTube was the Tetris movie, 446 from two weeks ago. So let's go to comments. Pull off comments I haven't responded to, and we're going to go back uh, seven days. Mecha Menace says, I remember seeing the trailer for uh, with those pixelated graphics and, um, in, the, um, in the trailer, and I was wondering if they were done for dramatic effect only in the trailer. My reaction was the same as yours. Shut up! Uh, if they were used in the movie, they would become distracting, and they absolutely did. On the other, uh, other than that, they were they weren't completely pixelated graphics, but rotoscoped in a low palette, low resolution, which is a step beyond a standard paint program filter. Uh, though I wonder if the text of this movie made a filter to process those frames or just did them manually. I don't know. Don't know. Uh, we got a couple more from him. He says, holding out for a hero is a good one. Uh, I think, I always think of that chase at the end of Short, Cir- Short Circuit 2 where Johnny Five puts on the mean eyes and somehow can't immediately catch a fat man. I remember there was a boat too. Maybe it had something to do with it. If you want to watch Holding Out for a hero, Hero-esque hero action uh, sequence, I recommend watching the Bubblegum Crisis opening. It's not only It not only spoofs the song, but also cuts between a musical performance um, a la Streets of Fire and sexy 80s Diane Lane, still sexy, and rampaging Mega Man-powered snatcher robots in uh, disguise. Uh, it's probably one of the best opening sequences ever. You'll want to watch the retro crush channel uh, clip as they did an up res of the video and audio. You know, it, it, I know this is off topic from what you're talking about, but two weeks ago we were discussing Mega Man and I was going to play Mega Man 8 for the first time and I haven't got around to it, but that's still on my radar. So hopefully next week we can discuss Mega Man 8. Uh, finally, he says the Game Boy lab scene looked so fake in the trailer. Yeah, it looked pretty fake in the movie too, but... Um, it was still it was enjoyable up until he coded a prototype of of Tetris in like ten minutes. That was just too bad. Uh, Fifty two minutes in, he says, "I'm not mad at anyone for playing a video game. I'd be surprised if a, I came across a person, not even a gamer, who said they did not recognize Pac-Man or Tetris." I like situations where I come across people at garage sales and they surprise me by saying they do or used to play mainstream games. Came across a lady in her 50s once who had some Mac discs for Doom and American McGee's Alice and a little old, uh, and had a little old school chat. Yeah, Mega Man, I couldn't be surprised, let alone angered whether or not you played the eighth game in the series and hadn't paid nor realized there was Mega Man 7 before I rented 8. I recommend you go back to, uh, to Mega Man Legends, more so Mega Man Legends 2, which I played first and won't let you, uh, um, and won't set you on all sorts of if you plopped into the Mega Man Legends universe. They're fun action RPGs. They still look great. The only thing that feels off is the control. It's very grid-like. Not as grid-like, not as rigid as Tomb Raider, but I feel as if Mega Man is snapping to specific angles and it can feel slow in that respect. Hmm. I will check it out. Thanks, man. Uh, Alex Swingle says on my Wizardry 5 Let's Play, you brave man, congrats. Thanks much. (laughs) Hemrock says, let's play with CF... With a generic gamepad. I'm pumped. Thanks for putting this up. Yeah, no problem, man. Hope you enjoyed it. And that is the fail bag for this past week. And I know it's a little early, but I'm running out of time. So uh, I think I think that might be... I think that might be... You know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it is. That's right. It's time to hang it up for the week. Thanks very much for clicking in and hanging out and talking some video games and listening to some chip tunes. I always appreciate the time you spend here. Uh, it's it's fun for me to come talk about games. I love it. I'm, these past like three or four episodes have been 
They've been, it, they, I feel like we've been on a good stretch for TCR. I'm playing games again and I'm, in, I'm really enjoying them. So thank you for that. Uh, whatever it is you're dealing with, you, with in your life, I hope it goes well for you. I really do. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you next week.